Hi, everybody. My name is Debbie. I'm one of the nurses at Advocate Christ Medical Center. Um, I worked with Mary for a very long time, and she was our dedicated nurse in the adult surgical heart unit. So we had some very, very sick people that she uh, took care of over there and got them back in shape nutritionally so that they could leave. Um, she's not only she's dedicated to the cardiovascular thoracic unit as well as the heart transplant and the assisted device program. Uh, a couple of years ago, she returned to school and she is now pursuing her master's degree in nutrition. She's been involved in several research projects with result, which resulted in published articles in peer reviewed journals and poster presentations at local, national, and, and international meetings, and a few oral presentations. And I've had the privilege of working with her on a um, nutritional project that we've had going on in the surgical heart unit as well. So you guys are very lucky to have her speak with us tonight, and she's got a lot of knowledge, and she's a great dietitian. So here she is, Mary Brickerty. When I was asked to do this presentation, I started reflecting on all my conversations with patients that I end up talking to to evaluate for a heart transplant or for a, a left ventricular assist device, which is a pump that helps a heart pump. So I decided that we would be covering, let's see if I can get things to work. Am I supposed to be aiming in a certain direction? <laughs> no, just okay. okay, I can go behind and click, please. Okay. We'll see if I can click. Oh, I can click now. <laughs> so I, I want to make sure that you appreciate or understand the uh, the way that our cardiovascular system works and that we have to protect the integrity of the system so that it works efficiently. And then we're gonna look at the link between diet and heart disease. You probably heard a little bit about it already, but we're gonna look at the strength of the evidence. And then we're gonna look at how plant-based diets provide protection. And from there, we're gonna dive into the recommendations from the American Heart Association and then see how they affect the nutrition facts label because most of us end up buying some foods that have labels on them and we've been given one set of guidelines and there's a little bit of tweaking we need to do for heart health. And then finally, we'll just kind of review the steps to an optimal plant-based diet that can help prevent and reverse heart disease. So the first thing, let's make sure we got our physiology under control here. We have the hardest part of the cardiovascular system and the cardiovascular system also includes all the arteries and veins. And you can see that they go from the top of the head to the bottom of the feet to all the fingers. The, and it's, the system circulates the blood to all those regions. It also sends all the nutrients to those regions, that, uh, to all parts of our body. And when I talk about nutrients, we're talking about macronutrients like carbohydrates, protein and fat, and micronutrients like vitamins and minerals, as well as some other nutrients like fiber and nitric oxide. To appreciate what our cardiovascular system does, it's it, I came across this video that helps explain it better, what we're trying to keep you know, the, the structure intact as well as the blood flowing freely. And one of my dietitians said, oh, you can use this as a display to give you an idea. But I think this video will help you understand it even better. So we're gonna watch this for a couple of minutes. And do I just hit play for this? You're gonna do it that way. Okay, thank you. Okay. And is the volume up enough for this? Nope. Pause for one second. All right, bear with me. So I can get to me. Okay. Okay. Try that again. Yeah. You know what? One more thing.
I'm glad I have a Jeffy person with me today. This is not my very <laughs> specialty. Oops. There we go. Is that as long as it goes? Oh, the other remote. Infection time, lifestyle, and environment have not yet begun to take their toll. Like water flowing in a channel brook, it is its bloodstream smoothly, and with little effort through these arteries, and each heartbeat. Can you all hear it? Easily absorbed by the contractile force of the heart, which keeps the blood moving forward in a laminar flow. But time is not kind to the arterial system. As the years pass, the child grows taller. His blood pressure must rise to produce the larger, erect body of an adult. As he eats animal fats and is exposed to environmental stresses, his blood gets thicker. As a result, his heart must work ever harder. Like a steam heating system, the circulatory system is a closed system. The arteries must absorb all of the stress from the laboring heart. A vicious cycle begins. As the heart works harder, arteries in certain regions of the system are overstretched, almost to the point of rupture. The most vulnerable arteries are those located near the heart, acting as shock absorbers. The proximal aorta and the arteries feeding the heart and brain absorb the impact of ejected blood as it is punched into the arterial system by the now forcefully contracting left ventricle. These arteries begin to be stretched to their limits. Arteries in the lower extremities also become overstretched, but for a different reason. The pool of gravity on the blood and the legs of a person standing upright adds to the already decreased pressure in the arterial system. To protect themselves from further stretching and possible rupture, the arteries in these vulnerable regions begin to thicken, stiffen, and harden. In other words, they adapt. As the arteries get tougher, they become less compliant, drastically changing how the blood flows through these regions. To continue to maintain life sustaining perfusion, the blood flow becomes turbulent. The turbulent flow sets the stage for the initial event and causes atherosclerosis. The turbulent flow eddies form in the arterial bifurcations, changing direction with each contraction of the heart. The back and forth flow of the blood is abrasive, like sandpaper. The intima of the artery adapts to this assault by forming a callus to protect itself from injury. At the same time, the blood flow dividers and arterial bifurcations are subjected to yet another type of injury. This is high shear stress, which occurs with every heartbeat only at the peak of systole. These high velocity bursts pound on the intimal surface of the flow divider, wearing it away. The intima adapts to this attack, forming its own type of callus to protect itself. Think of these calluses as the normal physiologic response of the intima to mechanical injury. Nature has programmed the epidermis and other cells in the body to protect themselves from repetitive injury in their own ways. The arterial system is no exception. These calluses eventually develop into what medical science calls early atherosclerotic plaque. Each callus, a bump in the arterial wall, further disturbs the blood flow and creates more turbulence in the non-compliant regions. This sets into motion the end stage of the deadly cycle of atherosclerosis. In a distortion of the original adaptive process, the callus grows as this cycle accelerates. The increasingly turbulent blood flow instigates the buildup of more and more plaque. How fast the plaque grows and what shape it takes depends on the composition of the blood, genetics, lifestyle, and environmental stresses. Most often, Final event is plaque rupture or dissection that almost instantly stops all blood flow. 
the stroke or heart attack or amputation follows. The chain of events that force the heart to overwork and to function so inefficiently has again claimed another victim. One of the 16 million Americans afflicted with cardiovascular diseases. So our goal is to keep our arteries pliant and patent and flexible and soft and the blood flowing through freely. And that is what we're trying to accomplish. It's hard to do because we can't see it happening, right? It's all inside and just taking place. And it's kind of the same way with diet to a certain extent because we eat, but we don't always think about the nutrients and how it gets into our uh, into all of our cells and keeps our arteries and strong as well. So the one thing that we know is that lifestyle choices matter. There are a series of, there's different, what they call pillars that make a difference. Food and beverage choices, physical activity, stress, relationships, sleep, and smoking. And it turns out that 80% of heart disease is of our own making and preventable. And the three harmful habits that we have is unhealthy eating, being sedentary. So I should probably have you all get up and walk a little bit around in circles, right? And smoking. So we're gonna be talking about obviously diet and we have to think about what's on our plate you may have thought about what you had for dinner before you came here and how it matches up with the plate. But at the moment, I'm also gonna ask you to look at this plate and tell me what percentage of this plate is plant-based. How much? About 75%, all right, at least. Because protein could be meat, fish, or poultry. It's at least 75%. We don't think about that. If you think about what you ate, did you have 75% of your plate was plant-based? Okay. Maybe not. Maybe, and you might need to consider thinking about that a little bit more. Because that's what we're going to talk today. There we go. And it turns out whole foods plant-based is really important. It's not just being plant-based. It's about being whole foods plant-based. And that is the basis for MyPlate.gov, which is our plate here, the dietary approach to stopping hypertension, the DASH diet, and the Mediterranean diet. It does not mean that you have to be vegan or vegetarian. Plant-based means that we choose to avoid the meat and poultry, seafood, dairy, and eggs. It doesn't mean you have to exclude it like vegetarians do with meat, poultry, and fish. And vegans, they do this, uh, they exclude meat and poultry, seafood, dairy, and eggs. But we need to cut back a lot on what we have in that area. And what is interesting to see in the research of this is that there's been three big studies that have come out with some results. And they looked at similar healthy lifestyles. And the only thing that changed was the diet, dietary pattern that they looked at. And so we're going to look at the one from North America called the Adventist Health Study 2. It has over 96,000 participants, which is huge because when Deb and I do research, we're lucky to get 100 people to participate. So 96,000 is a lot. And then the UK has the Epic Oxford Study. They had more than 65,000 people. And then the Taiwan has two studies going on and they have a good number, uh, greater than 12,000 for the first study on uh, the vegetarian study and then greater than 6,000 for the health study. All of these studies are still ongoing. They are continuing to collect data and they will continue to report their findings. One of the findings that they have already published is on the risk of ischemic heart disease. And in the Epic Oxford, the risk of heart disease was 13% lower among pesto vegetarians, 22% lower among lacto ova vegetarians and vegans. So if you don't know what a pesto vegetarian is, that's a vegetarian who likes dairy, eggs, and fish. 
And the lacto ovo vegetarian is one who also does, just does the dairy and the eggs. <clears throat> In the Adventist Health Study, the risk of ischemic heart disease was 23% lower among pesco vegetarian men, 24% lower among lacto ovo vegetarian men, and 55% lower among vegan men. The study had a really large group of women in it, and they didn't find anything significant in their findings to date. We we'll want to see where that goes. The risk of hypertension in the Adventist Health Study, they came out with a 55% uh, lower risk among lacto-ovo vegetarians and 75% lower among vegans. And the risk of stroke, well, this one was a little bit more interesting in the sense that the Adventist Health Study and the Chuchi studies saw lower risk, you know, the risk was decreased. But in the Epic, Epic Oxford one, theirs ended up being higher. So they have decided to do further studies to determine why that was such a difference. There was one more other, uh, another study on the risk of stroke, and this looked at a plant-based diet index. So they gave it a rating. And if you had a low rating, that was considered really good. And they found that the risk of stroke was 10% lower in those who had a predominantly healthy plant-based diet 6% lower in those with a high intake of plant foods and a low intake of meat or animal foods, and 5% higher in those with predominantly unhealthy processed plant foods. So you could be plant-based and not have a healthy diet. You could have a plant-based diet and have a healthy diet, depending on what you choose. Usually the unhealthy plant-based diet will have processed, more processed foods than anything else. And if we look at treatment outcomes with plant-based diets, uh, we have found that they, they've been able to demonstrate that uh, the risk factors are improved. So we're talking about lowering blood pressure, losing weight and keeping it off and having uh, lower blood cholesterol levels. And, though, and even if you have blood sugar issues, they see that that will also be low. Uh, you'll have better glucose or glycemic control. There's one other study that I want to mention that, that looks at a successful lifestyle, and all of these are um, from the blue zone areas. Have you heard of the blue zone? Are you familiar with it? Okay, there was about 20 years ago, a group of people got together and decided they were going to look for communities throughout the world that had healthy lifestyles where people lived to be more than 100 years old. And <coughs> they found five communities throughout the world. One of them is here in the US and California. Obviously it's the Adventist group, but it was kind of funny that there, but then they, and the one that I heard most about was the one in Okinawa, Japan. And then they have three others. One is in Sardinia and then in Costa Rica and in Greece. And these people all share a common diet is that they stay primarily plant-based. That's the basis or the foundation of their eating. And so they, they have some other things they got, they identify any other factors that also make it a successful lifestyle. But the diet was one thing that stood out. So in the end, we know that we have enough to make a lifestyle medicine, the first line of therapy for individuals with lifestyle induced heart disease, which makes sense, right? You would do lifestyle choices, to make, you can improve upon that. So all that research has been trickled down to the American Heart Association and they have come up with their diet recommendations and there's eight of them. So I thought we would go through each one of them and you'll see that they are really leaning into the plant-based world. A lot of these are very simple in the way they stated them, but I have some additional comments or things for you to consider. So, and the only one I really won't talk a lot about is the last one, which is limited or preferably no alcohol intake. So I don't have a lot to say about that one. I thought it was rather self-explanatory. So we're going to start with a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. <laughs> Sounds easy, right? But there are a couple of things that I want you to consider about vegetables and fruits. If we look at our food from, uh, in 
as it relates to calories per pound. So we're making everything equal, uh, a, a very equal basis for evaluating vegetables and fruits, which are to the left of the red line in this chart, are going to be the lowest in calories and the highest in nutrients, which is what we want. And then the foods to the right, or the right of the red line, which include animal products, junk food, and nuts and oils, they tend to be high in calories, but lower in nutrients. They do have nutrients because we all have heard about the omega-3s and the, you know, the different uh, vitamins and minerals that, that they kind of point out for their individual products. But overall, in relationship to the amount of calories that you get, it's lower nutrients. So I, the last time I showed that slide, people were like going, I can't read it really well. So I took this in pieces for you. So I left at the line where the green, uh, that, <coughs> that was the food, the vegetables and fruits. And then we also have, the, you include the whole grains and legumes. So vegetables come in at hundred calories per pound. Fruits come in at around 300 calories per pound, whole grains at 500 calories per pound and legumes at 600 calories per pound. We know that when people choose these foods, they will get, a, you know, they can eat a lot more food because they're lower in calories and they get a lot more nutrients. And in the US where we have now gone from a population of being overweight to being obese in the last 10 years, this is a way to help lose weight as well. Now going to the foods to the right of the line that help you gain weight, if you don't watch how much you eat, we have, uh, this group is kind of like they're higher in calories than the, the group to the left of the red line, right? And they are moderate in nutrition uh, and the nutrients. So avocados come in at 700 calories per pound. Bread is at 1,200 calories per pound. Chocolate is 2,400 calories per pound. Seasoned nuts are at 2,800 calories per pound. So you can sort of see where that kind of, they keep getting higher, the calories per pound. <laughs> and you get a little bit less nutrients per pound. And then this is where the saturated fat, the calories just, and then the salt and the sugar tend to go way up on this group and the nutrients are way low compared to the, the amount of calories per pound. So animal protein comes in at 1,000 calories per pound, cheese is at 1,700, junk food at 2,100 calories per pound, and oils come in a whopping 4,000 calories per pound, which is why they only tell you to have a tablespoon, right? Isn't that what it says on the label when you go to pour the olive oil into whatever you're making, that a serving size is a tablespoon? because you can only take a little, little bit. Another way to look at what our vegetables and fruits can do for us is if we have a, take a standard meal is around 500 calories. If you have a 1500 calorie diet, 500 calories per three meals. So 500 calories is usually what we look at. If you just try to have oil, it barely coats the bottom of your your stomach there, okay? Cheese and meat, yeah, they kind of give you a little bit more, but you're still gonna be hungry because you will not feel satisfied. And then you get to the potatoes and beans, they help you a lot more, but it's not till you get to your fruits and vegetables that you can feel satisfied. And you're gonna feel full. So it's really, it's a, it helps us to be able to get our fruits and vegetables in. And what makes the fruits and vegetables so good for us, and the whole grains, believe it or not, is the fiber in it. And we just talked about how it increases satiety. That means it also reduces the cravings. So if you find that you are having cravings, maybe you need to shift around what's on your plate so that you have more fruits and vegetables. Fiber also reduces cholesterol levels, um, promotes regularity, which is, I think, what most of us think about. Uh, reduces the risk of colorectal cancer, builds and maintains a healthy gut microbiome, which I've really gotten into lately about getting the gut bacteria healthy, stabilizes blood sugar, reduces the risk of GI disorders, 
enhances the immune function and lessens hormonal imbalances. Has a lot of things it does for us, that fiber. And the recommended daily allowance that the government has set for us is 30 grams per day for men and 25 grams per day for women. But in reality, the optimal intake is 40 to 60 grams per day. So that's a little bit, the, the US government has been very generous to give us a little lower rate there. But to really be helpful, we would be better off with a little bit higher amount of fiber. But then if we look at the actual standard American diet, the amount of fiber that you get in that, it is more to 15 to 17 grams per day. So it's really low. So if we could even get up to the amount that the American government wants us to, that'd be great. If you do the whole food plant-based diet concept, you are getting the optimal intake of fiber automatically when you choose to get more fruits, vegetables, and grains on your, on your plate. If you ever tried the paleo diet, has anybody ever given that one a try? Okay. That one's high in vegetables, fruit, seeds, and nuts, and that gets 70 to 150 grams of fiber. And you have to remember that fiber, you can only find it in plant foods. You will not find it in meat, fish, or poultry. So you can't. So if you really are going to work on getting your fiber up, you have to really aim for your plant foods. And so here are some examples. If you have one cup cooked of beans, you get 10 to 20 grams of fiber. If you, you can do an avocado, whoever thought that there was fiber in that, that comes in at 13 and a half grams of fiber for a seven ounce piece of, uh, of an avocado. If you do grains, like a cup, you get five to 10. Berries, uh, if you do a cup, is about three to eight. Other vegetables and fruit that are raw, around two to five. And a fourth of a cup of nuts and seeds come in at two to five. Now, some people will say to me, well, I'll just take a supplement, a fiber supplement. That will be the easiest way to go. That may be easy, but it's not, you're missing, you're only getting one type of fiber. And we need a variety of fibers because they offer different profiles that help with the digestive system and then also get, you know, like the soluble and soluble, I can even speak now, insoluble fibers that we use to help lower cholesterol and things like that. So we need to have a variety of fibers in our diet. Then there's whole grains. I kind of hinted to them already a little bit. And there was this great study um, a few years ago that looked at 45 studies uh, that reported a reduced risk of mortality for just three ounces of a whole grain, which is like a fourth of a cup, which isn't a lot when you think about it, but it has to be a whole grain. And then, so all-cause mortality dropped 17% and cardiovascular disease dropped 22%. So you don't have to do a lot, you just have to do a little, right? So what is it about the whole grain? So we have the whole grain on the left. It is has a nice outer lining that is full of fiber and it has B vitamins and minerals. And then you have the little germ which is the nutrient dense core with the B vitamins and vitamin E, phyto, phytochemicals and healthy fats. The middle section is a starchy carbohydrate. It does have some proteins and minerals. But then when, they when we define it, we when we refine it, we lose the bran and the germ and we end up with the endosperm. So we end up losing 80 to 90% of the fiber 70, 80% of the vitamin and minerals and 95% of the phytochemicals. We're missing out. So when we look at a whole grain, we have to think about the ones that are intact. That's the whole grain in its natural form. So that would be like wheat berries, brown rice, groats, quinoa, barley. And then if you smash it or crack it open, you end up with steel cut oats and cracked wheat. If you, and after you crack it, if you want to roll it out to get some more <laughs> of that out, you end up with rolled oats, barley, and rye. And then you can, if it gets broken up into enough pieces, you can shred it and you have your shredded wheat. And then we get down to the point where we pulverize it into flours, flake it, 
for cold flake cereals, and then we've seen puffed wheat, rice, and millet type products. So you can see the there's variations or degrees of processing here. And we wanna be as close to the top as possible of what we can tolerate. One way to think about this is, if you had a cup of flour in a bowl, would you eat it? Raw flour. Does anybody try it? No, I've never tried it either. <coughs> Nor am I inclined to. But so what do we do to it to make it more palatable? We add oil, sugar, salt, food additives, right? All those go in to make that a much more palatable food item. And that ends up getting into highly processed foods, which are not as healthy for us. So we are aiming for minimally processed. So I wanted to go through this just a little bit through examples of what we're talking about as minimally processed. If we take the apple, which keeps the doctor away, if you press it, we get apple juice, so it's more processed. If you go for the apple pie that has the added salt, added oil, added sugars, it becomes highly processed. It's no longer minimally processed, right? If we looked at vegetables, soy is really popular. Edamame is what we see on our vegetable craze now. I've been seeing it more, you know, vegetables and that type of thing. If you break that down in, we can get tofu. And then the highly processed would be those veggie burgers that have become so popular recently. The only problem with these new veggie burgers is that they've added salt, oil, and sugar, which all create problems. Most of us like bread. The minimally processed bread, there's a few brands out there that are very low in the fats and the salt. But most of us end up having moderately processed breads. And then highly processed would be like your dessert breads or cake breads and things of that nature. Because what did they add? Sugar, salt, and oil. You getting the hang of this? Do you see there's a theme? <laughs> OK. Let's look at bats here. Uh, the whole food would be the avocado. How much of that avocado is considered a serving size? Does anybody know? Actually, a third of the avocado is a certain size. But anyway, then we, if we processed it, uh, we could make guacamole, right? Mm -hmm. And if we really stripped out all the fiber and the water and a lot of the nutrients, you end up with avocado oil, which is more processed. I think that gives you the idea of what minimally processed is going to look like compared to highly processed. So the, for the next recommendation is to, and this is exactly as I say it, healthy sources of protein, mostly plants. Low fat or non-fat dairy, and if you eat meat and poultry, ensuring it is lean and unprocessed. Okay, so when we talk about protein, it's one of our macronutrients, so we do have to have it. Protein breaks down into amino acids, and there's 20 of them. Nine of them we have to get from our food. We only need about 0.8 grams per kilo per day, and that's based on a healthy weight. So if somebody's a heavier, we have to do what we call an adjusted weight. The protein targets, um, once we reach age 19, get it in a boat, is uh, going to be, if we use 154 pounds as a weight to determine the grams per day. It's 56 grams for the male, 45 for female. There has been discussion now within the whole food plant-based community that it looks like we have to add about 10% to that protein base because of some of the pro uh, proteins can be a little bit harder to digest and absorb. So they want to add a little bit more in, so it's about 10%. So the number comes up for 62 grams for the male adults and 50 grams for the female. So what does our, so of course somebody does a study, right? How many grams of protein does, are people getting? So these are seven countries that have reported on what meat eaters get, vegetarians and vegans. The average intake is 92 grams for meat eaters, which is way above the guidelines. So people are getting way more than enough. 
76 grams for the vegetarians, which still is above the, the numbers that I gave you, right, for the general area, and 72 grams of protein for vegans. So everybody's getting enough protein, whether you go plant-based or not. Another way to look at it is to, so the plant foods, are the ones that I have in bold, are basically between 15 and 31 grams of protein. And on the right, three ounces of the meat, fish, or poultry are also in that same range. So you can easily make the swaps and get enough protein. And the other benefit of going plant-based is that you get the fiber with it, the phytochemicals, the antioxidants, the pre and probiotics, plant sterols and stanols, and you don't have to worry about the saturated fat as much or the trans fatty acids because those are very low or zero. And the animal protein doesn't offer those for you. They are moderately high in both saturated fats and trans fatty acids. The next excuse one is, excuse me, I have a question. Go for it. Um, how does protein drinks fall into that category? As far as being protein? Like a uh, insure shake that we offer at the hospital type of thing? Or even, even some of the protein, the uh, whey protein. The whey protein? Whey, whey protein. It becomes, uh, those are animal proteins for the most part. There are some vegan options available. People tend to use them when they're looking at weight building or endurance athletes, and they're looking to pump up the amount of protein that they're getting. For the majority of us, not usually an issue. In the hospital, maybe a different thing because you're in a very catabolic state. A lot of times you're not moving a lot, you're losing muscle, so we're looking to preserve lean body mass at that point. So you might see when you're hospitalized, you might see it if you are an endurance type athlete and you're into really high marathon, you know, really, you're really into sports, which I'm not that good at. But so, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, so in a, it does kind of count toward your daily requirement. Yes. It, and it would be better to go toward to stay away from the animal. Right, and you want to stay more to the whole food so you get all the other benefits. Liquid non-tropical vegetable oils. I don't know if y'all all have seen that before, but I, it, it was an interesting one. We do need fats in our diet, so I'm not going to have any. So we do need it because we need the essential fatty acids. And to look at that, the way this goes, um, we have our fatty acids. They break down into saturated and unsaturated fats. So saturated fats, we normally think of as animal fats, but now the American Heart Association is saying, you gotta pay attention to the tropical oils as well. So you wanna watch out for palm oil and coconut oil. When we do the unsaturated fats, they break down into the polyunsaturated and the monosaturated fats. And this is where you find those omega fatty acids. Most people get really hung up with the omega-3. I got to get more omega-3 in my diet. For heart health, it turns out it is the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 omega that makes the difference. And it needs to be a four to one ratio that has been proven to be most healthy. And the foods that have that ratio are going to be things like salmon, tuna, flax seeds, lentils, black beans, plain Greek yogurt just to give you an idea. The other thing that I think a lot of us miss about fats is that their profile includes saturated fats and unsaturated fats. So if you're trying to lower your LDL and your cholesterol reading, the goal is to reduce or minimize the saturated fats. And all of our oils have saturated fat. Even the olive oil, even the canola oil, they all have saturated fat. But as you can see, they have the monosaturated fatty acids and the polyunsaturated as well. And so the olive oil, which is here, has a larger proportion of the 
um, this unsaturated gas. So then it's considered a healthier version, but if you're still trying to lower, you're, you're trying to correct your lipid profile, you have to reduce the saturated gas. So the recommendations from the USDA, 35% uh, upper tolerable limit for total fat from calories, which is very generous. And this is, I bring this up because it's gonna be in the nutrition facts um, label that we look at. What they also recommend is that we really get 30% total fat from our calories and that the saturated fats would be 10% of calories and cholesterol is at 300 milligrams. And that's because that's for the basically healthy population that doesn't have heart health issues. When you get to the American Heart Association, they go, okay, we agree with the 30% total fat for calories. But the saturated fat, we want you to go down to 5%, cut it in half. And for cholesterol, we're going to ask you to go down to 200 milligrams per day. So if you took 2,000 calories and you took the 30%, and you bring it down, the, uh, the saturated fat would be at 10% for the USDA would be about six grams. So for the American Heart Association, we're talking three grams for saturated fat per day. So if you did olive oil, which is our favorite oil for most of my patients, and you did one tablespoon at each meal, because right, we always have a little fat in every meal, it would be 14 grams of saturated fat. You're already over three grams. Cheddar cheese, if you just took one slice, is at six grams. If you have a three ounce serving of broiled beef at 85% lean, it's five grams of saturated fat. Ice cream is right along the same line. Peanut butter, two tablespoons is your daily allotment at three grams of saturated fat. Salmon, you can get by with one filet for two. So you're doing better. You got one extra gram of saturated fat you can have somewhere else. If you do lentils, like one cup, it's less than one gram of saturated fat. So guess where you want to get your, if you want to knock down your saturated fat, you need to aim for your plants. So then it means you're watching the processed foods, you're reducing the meat, fish, poultry part of things. And then there's the cooking aspect of it. And people always ask me, what do you do to cook without oil? If you all have the non-stick skillets, that's one way, right? Um, but you can also do moist cooking methods like steaming or boiling, braising, slow cookers, air fryers, broiling, grilling, microwaving, roasting, lots of options. If you like to bake, which I don't, so I don't have a lot of experience to tell you about those, but I have seen in the recipes that they use avocado, fruit purees, ground or mashed beans because I go through a lot of recipes. I look at a lot of recipes, I just don't do really well at making any of them. Uh, let's see, minimize intake of added sugars. A lot of us don't think about sugar as really affecting our heart. We always think about it in relation to diabetes. And there was another study that looked at a lot of articles and a lot of meta-analyses and they, uh, reported that added sugars have significant harmful association with 10 cardiovascular outcomes. So we now have to pay attention to sugar in diet. And how sugar affects the cardiovascular system is that it narrows the blood vessels. So when you narrow the blood vessels, you increase the blood pressure. Sugar also increases the salt sensitivity. Insulin resistance is closely linked to the hypertension. And then if you take sugar and combine it with fat or protein, it forms these um, advanced glycation end products, AGEs, and they are associated with inflammation and higher levels of oxidative stress. Now, sugar molecules come in three varieties, and one of them is fructose. And this one has been found to raise the levels of uric acid in the blood which in turn inhibits production of nitric oxide. And this one's kind of interesting because Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn out of the Cleveland Clinic, he's retired now from there actually, he's part of the Plant Strong Foundation, but his research, he found that 
if his patients would have six servings of leafy greens every day, it would help produce nitric oxide and improve the inner lining of the arteries, which we saw in our little video that we're trying to keep you know, soft and pliable and strong. And he says this creates an endothelial fortress if we do that. So fructose doesn't help it. And it goes in the other direction. And if you ever want to know what high fructose foods are, they are high fructose corn syrup, maple flavored syrup, palm or coconut sugar. So back to the recommendations. Keep in mind, as a country, we're having about 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. The USDA wants us to have about 12 teaspoons if you're on a 2,000 calorie diet. And 5% is what the American Heart Association wants us to do. That's like half of what the USDA wants us to do. But the problem is when you do the nutrition facts label, they don't talk about the number of teaspoons of added sugar nor do they tell you the calories. They work in grams. So to appreciate that, the, for men it's gonna be about 36 grams or less, and for women, 25 grams or less per day for added sugars. So to get an idea of what added sugars look like in some of our foods, if a lot of people are going toward energy drinks, they're getting a sugar high. It's 54 to 62 grams of sugar. It's like winding up your little kid when you give them too much candy, right? They go wild. They get wild on you. Sweet and iced tea is, comes in a uh, 12 ounce beverage it would be about 31 grams of added sugar. Peanut butter cups, one package is 21 grams of added sugar. Back to the ice cream, half a cup of vanilla ice cream is at 12 to 24, depending on the brand. A chocolate chip cookie comes in around 13 grams of added sugar. The 12 ounce soda is getting to look a little bit better, although if you have more than one, you're in trouble. 10 grams of sugar. Uh, barbecue sauce, two tablespoons. I don't know about you when you have barbecues, two tablespoons is not a lot of my food. Right? Do it, right? That comes in at 10 grams of added sugar. But if you choose fresh fruit, zero, you got it made. So if you want to use sugar, there are some alternatives to the added sugar. Uh, the recipes that I've seen use real fruit and vegetables like apples, bananas, dates. Dates are really popular in these recipes that I've seen. Prunes, beets, and carrots. Or you can use some flavorings, you know, you know seasonings like vanilla beans, cinnamon, fennel, and licorice. We're getting toward the one that we always associate with heart health. Yes. So added sugar refers to just like um, processed sugar and not natural sugar. Right. If it's, it's if you took it's a fruit that has like natural sugar in it, it's not coming in. If you take your a lot of sugar, in. and it can have, but it also has fiber and water and other nutrients. But if you do it like a baked apple where you added more sugar to it, they're talking about that added sugar. Right. So when you look at labels and it says added sugars, you want it, you want it to be lower. Yeah, I know that, but I thought added sugar means like um, table sugar and that kind of stuff, not um, natural, you know, fruit sugars. It is, um, and All of the items that I listed here have added sugars in them. They are processed in a way that they add sugar into it. It's not natural. I put fruit down there because there's zero added sugar. It does have sugar in it, but it's natural sugar. It's part of the, uh, the whole fruit. This is when you add the table sugar or the molasses, brown sugar, Okay, so what you're trying to say is instead of having ice cream, have fruit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> get the picture of how this works, you know. So now we get to go to salt. You, you're getting all excited about this because the heart is always, whenever you go to, at least these patients in the hospital, they always like give them the handout on low sodium, right? So here it is. 
So one teaspoon, just to remember, a teaspoon is 2,400 milligrams of sodium. The American, uh, uh, the USDA wants us to have about 2,300, so less than a teaspoon. We choose as Americans to have like 3,400 milligrams per day. The American Heart Association wants us to go down to 1500 milligrams you cannot go to zero on sodium because we actually need 500 milligrams of sodium per day thank goodness thank goodness right <laughs> yes is there or how much iodine is required iodine uh we do need some in our diet most of the time we get it through our salt um that's why when you go to the store, they usually have a choice between iodine, iodine salt, salt, and then some without. I can remember when I was younger, my grandmother used to tell me, once we finish this, you know, container salt, which has iodine in it, we now have to go to the, the one that we, without. We were supposed to alternate. The only problem is I had a salt container for about 20 years. That's how much I used my salt. <laughs> I don't know. Now I use it probably a little bit more, but for the most part, I'm not that big on salt. Am I not? No. So do you get enough of the iodine in your regular diet, or should you use iodine? So? Uh, you, if you go plant based, you do might need to use a little bit. You might need to get iodine supplement a little bit with some of the salt. Yes. My mom used to tell me in the forties phase that. If iodine for the school students, right? They didn't mm -hmm. take iodine for what I don't know. Well, there there used to be deficiencies. That's why they and ended up enriching the salt in order to get people to meet their needs. So it's probably in your and grocery store. It's probably in your diet, so. right. So. You're probably all aware that uh, what that in order to go from the 3,400 milligrams of sodium a day down to 2,300, which is what the you know the USDA wants us to do, that's a 36 percent reduction. If you're going to go to 1,500 from the 3,400, that's 60 percent reduction. So when I talk to my patients and I say and they say, "Oh, I'm on a low sodium diet," they go, "Oh, great! What do you do?" And they go. I took away the salt shaker from the table. That's 6%. I go, good, what else do you do? And they go, I stopped using salt in my cooking. And I go, great, that's 5%, 11%. We need to get down to, you know, a lot more. We have to cut out a little bit more. So the place where you have the best opportunity to reduce the amount of salt or so you may diet is going to the restaurant and processed foods. And I must say the pandemic has done a wonderful job of cutting out and down on people's going out to restaurants. I, now I ask people how often they go to the restaurant and it's like, oh, once or twice a month. And it used to be like every day. So that has been the one good thing the pandemic because everybody's cooking a little bit more at home. Now they don't necessarily tell me all the time if they're not using the salt, but um, anyway, the processed foods is going to be the next piece that we can look at that can really make a difference. More than 40% of sodium comes from a variety of these processed foods. So we know the pizza and the burritos and the tacos, eggs and the omelets, the cheese, savory snacks, they all have a lot of sodium. So if you can cut those out, Oh, down. Cut down is great, <laughs> but go toward, you know, there are some great plant-based burritos and taco items and even pizzas that are much lower in sodium. And, and how processed are they? They're yeah. less processed. They, uh, really? they, they will use more of a whole grain uh, and they will use, it, it's better. Your when goal I, is to keep going up. When I look at the vegan cheese and the, the vegan oh. sour grit, it's all yeah. so heavily processed. It is. And I don't use those when I eat it. Because now, it, oh, I don't know if you were here at the part when somebody asked me if I ate certain things and I have food allergies. So I don't do any dairy. 
And I don't do soy and I don't do fish and I don't do what other vegetable peppers. So I I get to experiment in the vegan world a lot. And I don't really do a lot of the cheeses. They really don't do. They don't, they're not satisfied at all. But I do love having pizza. Right? No, I get my pizza. I do okay that way. I'm learning to make tacos a little bit. I'm not too good at those. I think everybody else makes them better than I do. My cooking is not too great, as you can kind of gather. That was my forte in life. But we don't start. Some people have asked me about salt substitutes, and in regards to heart health, it's a problem because usually the salt substitutes are made out of potassium chloride, and that can impact the heart. So we say, we tend to say avoid those. So that leaves us with seasoning options. And I think, you know, the one thing that's great about our country is that we're the melting pot of the world. We have brought in all a variety of cultures and they have delivered a wonderful array of spice combinations. So there's like from Asia, you can look at the Chinese five spice. That's only one group obviously from over there. Europeans, we have the herbs de Provence from France, the Italian herb seasoning. Indians have the garam masala, which is really tasty. And then the Middle Eastern has a shawarma seasoning, which is, I enjoy that one as well. And there's a lot more. So you can change the profile of your meal by adding, doing the different seasonings from different cultures. So we're gonna move on to another topic, the nutrition facts label. You all know how to read them, right? <laughs> so, you know, the first thing to do is to look at the ingredient list, right? And what do you pay attention to on the ingredient list? Anything? Sugar. Where the sugar is, what the first three items are, right? And if it has sugar, salt, or oil first, you're going, no, thank you, right? So in this example, I have, uh, there's three ingredients on the left, and that is all different types of rice. This is also a rice blend that they've added Sea salt, sunflower oil, sugar, caramel flavoring, and it just added a few calories and it increased your uh, total fat and the saturated, uh, the saturated fat went up a little bit as well. So it's kind of uh, interesting. And they added, um, and the sodium went off the roof. <laughs> we went from zero to like 680 milligrams. You're all familiar. I think you all kind of know this. I'll just review so we're all on the same page. So in the blue section, we have our serving information. We have our calories in pink, the nutrients in yellow, and then the quick guide to percent daily value in the lavender color. So does anybody use the daily value at all? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the carbohydrates. You use, you look at the carbohydrates? Yes. Okay, so you look at the total carbs? Uh, yes, on the left. Okay. Uh, because my wife is a diabetic. Okay. So, uh, so that's what you pay attention to. Does anybody else look at anything on here? Sure. Yes. I'm sorry. Sodium. 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 You? Yes. Uh, back on the salt, the Himalayan or the sea salt, good, bad, better, worse. They uh, basically are the same um, molecular weight as all salts. They're, the, they're all the same in that sense. It's just as a, a larger molecule. So the theory is that you'll use less because it's bigger. Yeah. <laughs> they have different profiles because they have different, it's not always just straight salt in them. They have two little extra minerals. So we look at sodium, all right. And so then we know if it's 5% or less is low, then we say, oh, it's good, right? It's probably okay. 20% or more is high for sodium is probably not so good. So this one doesn't look too good. And so it depends on how you're gonna use it. If you're trying to aim low because you're limiting saturated and trans fat, cholesterol, sodium, added sugars, 
but you may want to look at the ones that are 20% or more is high if you're trying to get enough dietary fiber, vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium. I want to remind you that when you look at serving size, you have to compare it to what you are going to actually eat, your serving size versus their serving size, so that you make the right calculation. The daily value piece is based on healthy individuals. It's also based on 2,000 calories per meal plan, not the calories that are listed up here. So the basis for the daily value, I think I mentioned this before, but it's 35% for total fat, 10% for saturated fat, 300 milligrams for cholesterol, 2,300 milligrams for sodium, and 10% of added sugars. The problem is, if my clicker would go, we have to adjust it for heart health. So we need to take that 35% of total fat and bring it down to 30%. 5% is now the new level for saturated fat, which was half of what it was before. The cholesterol has been dropped down by a third. Sodium went from 2,300 to 1,500 and added sugars went from 10 to 5%. So the same, the label that I just showed you before, these are the new numbers. And it goes, okay, well, that looks fine. How does it really compare? So saturated fat went from 23% in the original to 41%. If we thought saturated fat went at 23% was too high, we really went really high for heart health, mm -hmm. right? Uh, cholesterol was a little bit closer to, you know, was lower at 12%, but now is 18%. It's creeping up to the 20% the level. Sodium is at 50%, 57% based on the heart guidelines. And then added sugars, five grams is a, a, at the 10% level, all right? It doubles, right? Because we had to drop it by 5%, so it goes up to 20%. So then that becomes high. So you just have to be really careful. You have to read the ingredients, make sure the ingredients are the, the main food that you wanna be eating. You wanna compare your serving size to what they actually have listed. And then you have to have your numbers for fat, sodium, and sugars to meet that 5% level. So I have a handout here from another dietitian who came up with a different method of figuring it out. So he does it by calories, gives you total grams, what not to go over, sodium, and added sugars. And if you get three out of three in the good range, you are pretty sure that it's going to be an okay product. Two out of three, I think it depends on what you're trying to really watch. If you're watching your sodium, you want to make sure that's in the right range. If you get three out of three that are all above the number, you know, the grams that are indicated here, you know that it's a product to leave on the shelf. So you all get a copy when you go home before you leave today. So now let's just kind of review and kind of put it all together. It's kind of simple. There's five steps. We're going to make whole plant foods the foundation of our meals and snacks, right? We're going to be picky about carbohydrates, aiming for those high fiber foods. We're going to go plant strong with protein sources instead of meat. Make whole plant foods the primary source of fat if you're going to go for your fat. Because think about it this way. How many olives do you need to use to make one tablespoon of olive oil? A lot of them. 20. Does anybody eat 20 olives at one time? No. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love olives. <laughs> All right. <laughs> But that's a lot of olives when you get down to it, right? I don't do it every day. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but if you think how often we have olive oil every day, you know, a lot of people will have it every day. That's a lot of olives. Um, choose whole food sweeteners or sweet enhancers instead of simple sugars. And then we can go back to Hippocrates, which is been, this statement has been attributed to. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And that's all I have to share with you today. Hopefully you learned something. Yeah. Any questions? Any more questions? Anybody have You're all ready to revise your yeah. Just don't sleep yogurt or the cheaper um 
Preserves are those mm -hmm. equivalent in the, in the dairy area as far as um, nutrition and health benefits. Mm -hmm. The plain, the plain, the unpaid, the plain, 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 the